our, our study of the subject of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, and uh, teaching on the Holy Spirit is a very different matter today, after 20 some odd years, 25 years of charismatic renewal in the church, than it was when I first began the ministry 20 years ago, because in the days when I first began the ministry, the Holy Spirit was a fairly neglected person, a fairly neglected subject. Uh, in the church. There were theologians who spoke of the fact that most Christians were very familiar with Jesus and with the Father, but to to them, the Holy Spirit was sort of a vague, oblong blur in their thinking because the Holy Spirit didn't seem to have any real uh, personality or character that, that most people attributed to him. And some people thought it was just as well that we don't know more than we do about the Holy Spirit. Of course, now, the these days, the Holy Spirit has been talked about a great deal. In fact, in some cases, I think the Holy Spirit receives prominence disproportionate to the attention given to him in the Bible. But um, we'll just do our best to, to, to go through and start with the most basic things and, and get as far as we can in surveying what the Bible tells us about the Holy Spirit. This is our series on knowing God. If you're going to know God... You'll need to know who the Father is, you'll need to know who the Son is, and you'll have to know who the Holy Spirit is, because all three are God. Now there are some, not so much anymore, but I, I guess there's, there probably are still some, but there have always been some who have always said the Holy Spirit, we shouldn't talk about the Holy Spirit, because after all, His whole purpose is to glorify Jesus. And when we begin to focus on the Holy Spirit, we're doing something that the Holy Spirit Himself would not approve. And they point out that Jesus said, in the King James Version, when the, when the Comforter comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, He will not speak of Himself, but He will glorify Me. What they're referring to is a verse found in John 16, verse 13, which is rendered somewhat differently to clarify it in the New King James and other versions. But in the King James Version it reads, However, when He, the Spirit of Truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth, for He will not speak of Himself. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Now, it was thought by some that when it said he will not speak of himself, that that meant that the Holy Spirit was kind of shy about making a reference to himself. He won't talk about himself. He'll only talk about Jesus. And this is how many people still, I think, understand this verse, though, as I said, the New King James and other versions have clarified it a bit. When it says he will not speak of himself, it does not mean that the Holy Spirit will not speak about himself. It means he will not speak from himself any more than Jesus spoke from himself. He says, I don't speak of myself. I, it's the Father who, in me who tells me what to speak. And as the New King James is correct in rendering the statement, he will speak on his own, he will not speak on his own authority. He won't speak coming from himself. He'll speak from the Father, just like Jesus didn't speak from himself, but spoke from the Father. Uh, and that's clear that that's the meaning because the very next line there, John 16, 13, after he says he will not speak of himself, he says, but whatever he hears, he will speak. So his, what the Holy Spirit has to say won't originate from himself. It will originate from what he hears, from God the Father. The same as Jesus said, I can speak nothing of myself, but what I hear, I judge. Uh, he said, I judge nothing of myself, but what I hear, I judge, or whatever. The point is that both Jesus and the Holy Spirit uh, claim that their speaking, their, what they have to say, does not originate from themselves, but comes from the Father. Now, the exact relationship of the Holy Spirit to the Father and the Son is never quite explained for us in the Bible. The Holy Spirit is very prominent in the Bible from the very opening verses of Genesis to the very end of Revelation. One of the first references to the Holy Spirit is in Genesis chapter 1, uh, which says, in, in one of those very first verses, maybe it's even verse 1, let me get it here. Uh, it is, verse, well, verse 2. It says, after God created the heavens and the earth, it says, the earth was without form and void, darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving or hovering or fluttering or brooding, different translations say, over the face of the waters. So we see the Spirit of God mentioned in the very second verse of the Bible. When you get to the end of the Bible, in Revelation, chapter 22, we see the Holy Spirit uh, is prominent there as the Bible closes down at the very end as well. Uh, in verse 17 of Revelation 22, it says, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. 
And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts come. And whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. Now this reference to the water of life for everyone who thirsts is a reference back to what Jesus said to the woman at the well. And also again in John 7 at the Feast of Tabernacles where he stood up and said, If anyone thirsts, let him come unto me and he that believes in me uh and drinks. He says, And he that believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, the water of life. And John says this, he spoke of the Holy Spirit. So the, one of the very last invitations in the Bible is to come, anyone who's thirsty, and drink of the water of life, which is, in, in Jesus and John's usage, uh, a reference to the Holy Spirit. So we have the Holy Spirit brooding at the beginning of the Bible and inviting those who wish to drink of him at the end of the Bible. And throughout the rest of the Bible, in between, he is also very prominent. Exactly how we are to understand the relationship of... Uh, of the Spirit to the other so-called persons or members or sides or whatever we want to use the term of the Godhead is not clear. After all, uh, the Spirit of God is sometimes called the Spirit of God's Son. In Galatians, we encountered this in our studies in Galatians chapter 4. Galatians 4. And verse 6 says, And because you are his sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son. That is the Spirit of Jesus. Has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your heart. Cry out, Abba, Father. In fact, technically, when we say Jesus is in my heart, to be technically correct, we, are, we must really mean the Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit is in our hearts, because Jesus personally as we understand it from Scripture, is in heaven at the right hand of God. And the Bible indicates he's not coming down from there until he's put all his enemies under his feet. The heavens must receive him until the times of the restoration of all things, Peter said in Acts chapter 3. So it's not Jesus personally who is in my heart. After all, he has flesh and bones, even in his resurrected state. He can't fit in there, but his spirit is in there. And in the, in the person of his spirit, he is there. Because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of God's Son. If you look at Romans chapter 8, we find again the Holy Spirit referred to as being the Spirit of Christ. And of course the term Spirit of God is also used to describe Him. Um, in verse... Uh, where do I want to start? There's a lot about the Spirit here. Uh, back in verse... 9, Romans 8 9 says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not of his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, the interesting thing here is the progression of thought here in verses 9 and 10. It starts out, if the Spirit of God dwells in you. Later, the same concept is described... You have the Spirit of Christ. Anyone who doesn't have the Spirit of Christ is not a his. And then finally, verse 10, Christ is in you. These are all different ways of saying the same thing. It's just that Paul uses these terms synonymously, interchangeably. The Spirit of God is in you. You have the Spirit of Christ, in which case the term Spirit of Christ is substituted for the term Spirit of God. And then Christ is in you. Because the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Christ is in you, Christ can be said to be in you as well. So, I mean, these are the. This shows the intimate connection between Jesus Himself and His Spirit. And, of course, we know very well that the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of the Father as well. He's the Spirit of the Son, He's also the Spirit of the Father. Uh, in, in, also in Romans 8, verse 11, it says, If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He, will raise, he that raised Christ from the dead, and this is a reference to the Father, because Galatians 1.1 1, 1 says the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. Galatians 1.1 1, 1 identifies him as the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. Well, this is now the Spirit of him, that is the Spirit of the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. And if that same Spirit dwells in you, then he will quicken your mortal bodies. And give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Obviously, we're already neck deep in the mystery of the triune Godhead again. I mean, who is this Spirit? Is He someone different than the Father and the Son? Is He somehow you know, homogenous with? 
the Father and the Son? What is the relationship here? The answer is, I don't know. There are definitely times when the term God and Spirit of God, or Holy Spirit, are used interchangeably. In Acts chapter 5 is one of those places. Acts chapter 5, when Ananias and Sapphira had sold a piece of land and lied to the apostles about how much they sold it for and pretended to be giving all, but really were keeping back some for themselves. Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not your own in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Now verse 3 says, Why did you allow Satan to fill your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? He says, It is not men, but God that you have lied to. The Holy Spirit is therefore being used interchangeably with the word God. In the Old Testament... Occasionally you find the reference to the Spirit of God or the Holy Spirit, and in these places, again, you could easily substitute the word God, and it would make perfectly good sense, too. So again, we've got some essential unity between the concept of God the Holy Spirit and the concepts of the Father and the Son, and yet there's some distinction. Because Jesus did not indicate, or for the most part, he indicated that the Spirit was someone different than himself and different than his father. But at the same time, there seems to be an identifying. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse uh, 17, 2 Corinthians 3, 17, it says, Now the Lord, which is, Paul usually means Jesus when he says the Lord, says the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now here the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of the Lord, but more tellingly, he says, the Lord is that Spirit. So if you have Jesus, the Lord, uh, if you have His Spirit in you, His Spirit is Him, or at least is somehow so, so intimately or intricately insinuated in the identity of Christ that you have Jesus in you, it could be said. Now, I'm, I'm mainly throwing out data without much explanation because I must tell you, I don't think anyone knows or can say dogmatically with authority exactly how this relationship all works. There's a sense in which we could understand the Holy Spirit just to be another name for God. As I said, the term Holy Spirit is used in the Bible sometimes just interchangeably with God. And it would make sense. Jesus, in talking to the woman at the well, said God is a spirit. Therefore, those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Also, there's hardly anything affirmed more adamantly in the Bible than the fact that God is holy. God is holy. If God is spirit, and if God is holy, then to speak of him as the Holy Spirit would seem the most natural thing in the world. And in some cases that appears to be what the Bible does. Yet, Jesus spoke about the Spirit in terms that seem to make some kind of distinction. What kind, we don't know. But some distinction between the Father and the Spirit. Because he said... Well, for example, I'll, I'll give you an example. In John chapter 14, beginning with verse 15 and 16 and so forth. John 14, 15 says, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth. Now what he says is, I will talk to the Father about this, and He will send you the Holy Spirit. As if we're dealing with persons who are not in every way identified with each other, not in every way the same, the Father is sending the Holy Spirit. So what can we say? We can say there's, uh, there are some things we will not understand. Probably, unless you get a direct revelation from God, which I have not yet received myself. But let's talk about what the Bible says affirmatively about the Holy Spirit so we can learn what is revealed. You know, in Deuteronomy 29, 29, I think that's the right reference, it says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that He has revealed are for us and for our children that we might learn to do all the words of this law. 
In other words, there's two categories of things. There's things that are secret and things that aren't. The things that aren't are the things God has revealed. That means what God hasn't revealed is still a secret. The secret things are God's alone. He hasn't told us those, and he doesn't, he's not required to. They're his. What he has revealed are ours. He's made them available to us so that what? We can learn how to obey him. He has revealed enough to us that we can live in a way pleasing to him. We need no, no more, but we obviously are, are, our curiosity is tweaked a bit, you know, by some of the things that are thrown out there in the scripture for us, truths are thrown out, and we can say, well, how exactly does that fit with that one? Well, we may never know, at least not in this life, because there's just some things God hasn't explained fully, perhaps because we couldn't understand it anyway. Our mind is finite, God is infinite. How can we contain in our little minds all the information that God knows about himself? There are no doubt things that we will not know until Jesus comes. Paul said, apparently trying to cause us to be content with you know, limited knowledge, in 1 Corinthians 13, he said, For now we know in part. Or for now I know in part. Then I shall know even as also I am known. I take the then to refer to the second coming of Christ. When Jesus returns, then I will know far better than I do now. God, how well does God know me? Very well. Completely, as a matter of fact. He says, when that time comes, I will know him as thoroughly as he knows me. But I don't now. Now I know in part. Then I will know as I am known. First Corinthians thirteen twelve. So we're just going to have to live with that. And if you thought that coming to school is going to somehow remove all the areas of uncertainty in your life about what the Bible means, you have some disappointments ahead of you. Because I am still very uncertain about many things simply because I refuse to be dogmatic about things that I can't find stated or explained in the Bible. I have my theories, I, 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 I conjecture and so forth, but I always let you know that's what I'm doing. There are times when I just don't know. But the fortunate thing is, all the things I don't know are things I don't have to know. I can still be a good Christian with just the information that is revealed. The things God hasn't chosen to reveal, apparently I don't need to know yet. Maybe if I'm faithful in the small things I already know, he'll reveal more to me. But I'm still working with... Yeah, I've got a lot of work to do still. I'm just do, living up to what has been revealed. A lot of people get real fascinated with all the mysteries of the Bible. You know, is there a gap between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2? If so, is that when the devil fell? And is the de How did the devil fall anyway? And how, you know, if he was so smart, why would he rebel against God? And also... I was wondering, is there life on other planets, you know, and uh, you know, does God, did God send Jesus to several different planets at different times, and has he done this before? I mean, who knows? Who cares? I don't care. I'll tell you, there was a time when I was really fascinated by perplexing, unanswerable imponderables. And uh, when, I, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I was a child, I acted as a child. When I became a man, if I could make that claim for myself in, in any way, um, I put away childish curiosity about things that are unponderable anyway, imponderable. Because the way I see it is, what it's really all about is, how do I live to please God? Amen. I have lost all interest in things that are merely objects of curiosity. Uh, well, not all interests, but most of my interests. I cannot be engaged for very long a time in a speculative discussion about things that don't have anything to do with how we live our lives. Uh, because I think that that's what God wants to do. The things he has revealed are for us and our children so that we might learn to do according to all things he's commanded us. So that's what he really wants. And so I can say, from what God does tell me about the Holy Spirit, I can, I can benefit, I can apply that truth, I can respond, I can interact with the Holy Spirit, I can know him from the things he does say. The things I don't understand... I'll let God understand those for now. Someday I'll know, even if also I'm known. In the meantime, I can live with my uncertainty or my ignorance. Now, having said that, let's find out what we can know about the Holy Spirit. I pointed out that He is God, certainly. And since He is God, He is clearly not an it, unless you think God is an it. And I say that because uh, it is very common... I have fallen into it myself, although I'm consciously trying to avoid it. But very common for Christians, in referring to the Holy Spirit, to speak of it. Now, I don't suppose that's the ultimate blasphemy, but it just isn't an ultimate compliment either to it. The Bible indicates he's not an it. 
We do that with babies right after they're born a lot of times, too. It's because when they're in the womb, we don't know who they are. We don't know if it's a he or a she, so whenever you refer to the baby before it's born, you say it, the baby, it, 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 you know, when it comes, you know, things change when it is here and so forth. And, and you, you, whenever you talk about the baby before it's born, it's always it. After the baby's born, there's still a tendency for a little while to still speak of the baby as it until you realize, oh, he's not a it, it's a he or a she, it's something not an it, it's a person. A he or she is a person. Now, eventually it no longer seems normal to call it it. I know this for a fact because I've had several babies and, I, and I've observed other people who talk about their newborns. Sometimes there's still the tendency to say it. Just because even though they now know that they've got a person there, they're so accustomed to not knowing that that was male or female that they've got a way of speaking. And I think Christians are that way too sometimes about the Holy Spirit. A lot of times they were totally ignorant of the Holy Spirit and they thought of it as an it. See, I just did it myself, thought of it. I should say thought of him as an it. But when you begin to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, it becomes very unnatural to speak of him as an it. It seems strange. It, it, it seems, it, it seems uh, you know, inappropriate. And I think we, should, we can gauge our own intimacy with the Holy Spirit to some degree by our tendency to fall into using the term it in speaking about him. Because once I talk about someone who's really a person, who's got a personal relationship, I have no tendency to speak of you as it, but as she or he, you know. Uh, I can't imagine you speaking of any person you know as it. It just isn't done. But we do that with the Holy Spirit because in many cases we really don't know it as a person. And uh, so we need to be cautious about that. Jesus spoke of the Holy Spirit on many occasions. He always said he, he, he. When the Holy Spirit, when the Spirit of God comes, when the Comforter comes, He will lead you into all truth. He will show you things to come. He will not speak of Himself, but will glorify me. He this, He that, and so forth. Throughout John chapters 14, 15, and 16. John chapters 14, 15, and 16. All three of those chapters. There are repeated references to the coming of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus repeatedly says He. I think the Jehovah's Witness Bible says it because they're wrong on this one too. They believe the Holy Spirit is simply God's active force, a little bit like electricity or, or energy or something other than a person. They don't, have, they don't believe in the Trinity, and therefore neither Jesus nor the Holy Spirit in their theology can be called God. Only the Father is God to them. But the Bible indicates that the Holy Spirit is God, and He is a He, not an It. Jesus never spoke of the Spirit as Him. Now, in the King James Version, there were several verses which accidentally spoke of the Holy Spirit as It. Uh, but those were mistranslations, and all modern translations have fixed that. The Holy Spirit is always referred to as He. And therefore, I think we need to learn to use that language in our talk of Him, too, or to become sensitive to the fact when we're not. Not because He's insulted. But because it's just a reflection of the fact that we're not thinking properly about a person. A person that we're seeking to be in relationship with. And uh, the indications that the Holy Spirit is a personality and not an it is, are seen in many ways in the scripture. For one thing, the Bible indicates that the Holy Spirit has emotions. Electricity doesn't have an emotion. Nuclear power doesn't have emotions. Energy doesn't have emotions. But the Holy Spirit has emotions. And uh, just to give a few examples, though they could be multiplied, back in the Old Testament, in Isaiah 63, in Isaiah chapter 63, speaking of how the Jews were disobedient repeatedly to God and invoked his frustration, uh, verse 10, Isaiah 63, 10, says, but they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he turned himself against them as an enemy and he fought against them. Speaking of the Jews, they grieved his Holy Spirit. A, a table or a chair cannot feel grief. Electricity can't feel grief. Grief is an emotion. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. The New Testament says so also. Paul says in Ephesians 4.30, Ephesians 4.30 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit. By whom you are sealed. In James chapter 4 and verse 5, we're told that the Holy Spirit gets jealous. Or some translations read it as a rhetorical question suggesting that he doesn't get jealous. I think I take it as an affirmative. In James chapter 4, 
in verse uh, 5. He says, Do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? I take that to be an affirmation that the scripture is correct in saying the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously. We saw already in Genesis 1-2 that when the creation was still formless and void, the Holy Spirit was moving. Some translations prefer the word brooding, yearning over the waters. The same Hebrew word there that's translated moving or brooding or whatever, hovering over the waters, is a Hebrew word that's used later in the book of Deuteronomy to refer to a, a mother eagle brooding over her young, over her, uh, her chicks. So it, it seems to speak of an emotion or a yearning on the part of the spirit. And James himself says, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously. So we have a number of references to the Holy Spirit experiencing emotions. This, of course, points to the fact that he is a personality. He, he is conscious. He is not an it. Furthermore, he is not only a person, but he's a communicative person. He communicates with people. We know from what we've looked at earlier in the scripture, in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21, that when the scriptures were uttered, when the prophecies of scripture were uttered, that it was the result of holy men of God being moved by the Holy Spirit. That in itself does not prove the Holy Spirit to be a person. We've already established that upon other grounds, but it does prove that he is in the process of communicating with people and giving information. In Acts 28-25, Paul indicates that the Holy Spirit talks. He speaks. Acts 28-25. He says, Therefore, let it be known to you... Oops, that's not right. Verse 25. So then, they do not agree among themselves. When they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul had said this one word, quote, The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah the prophet to our fathers, saying, well, we won't go on with what he said, but he said the Holy Spirit spoke rightly. The Holy Spirit talks. He speaks. In 1 Peter 1.11, this is one of the verses that in the older King James accidentally used the word it of the Holy Spirit but has been corrected in the modern translations but in 1 Peter 1.11 talking about the curiosity of the prophets who wondered if they, were, if they could get more information about the things they were prophesying about it says in 1 Peter 1.11 they were searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ who was in them was indicated when he that is the spirit of Christ testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would fall. The word he was it in the old King James when it testified, but more properly when he testified. The point is, it's don't testify. Walls and floors and cars don't testify. Persons testify. Persons speak. They bear witness. And so, uh, here we have, again, information about the Holy Spirit's role as a as one who speaks. In fact, we might well say that the Holy Spirit is the agent of God or the, I'm, I'm, I'm groping for a word, the aspect of God or the person of the Godhead who speaks to men. Would you look with me at 1 Corinthians 12, which is commonly remembered as the passage about the gifts of the Holy Spirit? And rightly so. That's what it is about. But in 1 Corinthians 12, there's an interesting introduction to the subject of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Just those first verses of 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles, carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, excuse me, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are diversities of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works in all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. 
but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. Notice the Holy Spirit also has a will. It's don't have wills, but He's do and she's do. Persons do. The Holy Spirit has a will. He distributes these gifts according as He wants to. Now, the interesting thing about this discussion of the gifts of the Spirit, which continues, of course, is that it begins with this statement in verse 2. You know that you were Gentiles, carried away previously before you were Christians, to these dumb idols. Now, when he says dumb idols, he's not just being, you know, trying to insult the idols. Say, boy, are you ever dumb? You know, I mean, the word dumb is not used in the scripture or in, in good English as a reference to stupid or, you know, of a low IQ. But rather, dumb has, a, has an actual meaning. It means unable to speak. Why does Paul, in this particular connection, speak of the idols as dumb? Of course, he's not the first to do so. Back in Psalm 115, the psalmist said, The idols, uh, the gods of the heathen are idols. They have eyes, but they don't see. they got ears, but they don't hear. they got mouths, but they don't speak. The fact that the idols are dumb is obviously common knowledge, and there's no reason to even have to state it. So why does he state it? Why does he bring that particular feature of the idols up in this discussion? The answer, I think, must be that he's saying, Before you were Christians, you had gods that didn't speak. Now you're a Christian, you have a God who does speak. But, when he does speak, he usually speaks through people, gifted people, to whom he gives utterance. And you need to know how to tell when he is speaking and when he is not speaking. For example, if anyone says Jesus is a curse, that's not the Spirit speaking. If someone says Jesus is Lord, then that is the Spirit speaking. In other words, he's saying, you're not accustomed to having a God who talks to you. You used to worship idols that don't talk. Now you've got a God who does talk. And he talks to you by his Spirit. And what happens here, normally speaking, the Holy Spirit speaks to you through persons who have gifts of the Spirit, which are interestingly called manifestations of the Spirit. In his discussion there, you know that, in, uh, where is it? Verse 7. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for his profit for all. And then he lists some of those manifestations or gifts of the Spirit. What is a manifestation but an unveiling, a revealing? When one is operating in a gift of the Spirit, he is manifesting the Holy Spirit. If a person speaks prophetically, he is manifesting a prophetic word that the Spirit has for the church. When a person has a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, a tongue, an interpretation, likewise. It's a manifestation of the mind of the Spirit to the church. We now have a God who does talk. When he does talk, one of the ways he talks, at least, is through gifts of the Holy Spirit. And Paul says you need to know how to recognize when it's a true gift and false gift, or how, when it's really the Spirit and when it isn't. If it's putting Jesus down, it certainly isn't the Holy Spirit. But if it's exalting the Lordship of Jesus, then that is the Holy Spirit. He gives a sort of a test to know if it's the Spirit or not. But the point here is, the Holy Spirit seems to be the agent of God through which communication comes to us from God, and even indirectly through gifted people who have the Spirit manifesting his wisdom or his, uh, his knowledge or his prophetic statements through them. There are also other gifts of the Spirit that don't have to do with speaking. Power gifts. So he also mentions to one who's given the gifts of healing, to another miracles. Uh, we could say also that the, the Holy Spirit is the agent through whom God's power is manifested in, in, to his people. His power and his thoughts. His words, his communication, is through the Spirit, and also his power is given through the Spirit. This concept comes from way back in the Old Testament, even. If you look at Exodus chapter 31, for example, Exodus chapter 31, in verses 3 through 5, when God gave instructions for the making of the tabernacle, not just everybody was allowed to do it. The work, it wasn't just on a volunteer basis. Anyone who wants to help out, come build the tabernacle. God had to anoint and give special gifts to individuals who would then be set apart to do the work. And in Exodus 31, uh, verses uh, 2 and following, it says, See, I have called by name Bezalel, or Bezalel, the son of Uri, and the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship or skill, to design artistic works, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, cutting jewels, 
for setting carved wood and the work of all manner of workmanship. Why? For the making of the furniture of the tabernacle. It, it required uh, woodworking to make the frames for the things like the ark and then the skill with uh, gold and silver uh, overlay and, and then there were the jewels for the breastplate. Had to, had to be skilled in setting jewels. These were skills that a person could possibly learn, obviously, through apprenticeship under a tradesman. But in this case, this man knew how to do these things because he was filled with the Spirit of God who enabled him to do it, who gave him skill and workmanship and wisdom and knowledge in these matters. This, in other words, means that the tabernacle is to be built not by people with fleshly skills or natural skills, but people whose skills were derived from the Spirit himself. It's a very early indication of what we find repeatedly in the Bible, that God's work has to be done by God himself, through people. But we do not have the capacity, even if we have to be very clever or very skillful, we don't, or, or very, you know, articulate. We don't have the ability to do God's work for him, except as his spirit is given to us, so that the, the spirit of God through us does the work of God. Uh, there were no doubt other craftsmen who had skills, who could do some of those same things and probably maybe do them as well. The difference is they weren't anointed. The work of building God's house is to be done by those who have the anointing of God and the gifting of God to do it, not those who can boast in their own abilities to do it. And so, the Holy Spirit is the one who empowers to do these things. If you'll notice over in 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, a, a lesser known passage about the gifts of the Spirit. When people think about the gifts of the Spirit, they think first of all of 1 Corinthians, chapters 12 through 14. Then they probably think of Ephesians 4, and maybe Romans 12, and very few other passages that focus on the gifts of the Spirit. And I think... Least often of all, people think of 1 Peter chapter 4, though it too has every right to be included uh, in, as a, a significant passage on the, Holy, on the gifts of the Spirit. The main thing is it's only two verses, and therefore it, it isn't a lengthy discussion. But in 1 Peter chapter 4, we get some very insightful things, I think, about the gifts. 1 Peter 4, verses 5, uh, 10 and 11 says, As each one has received a gift minister it or use it to serve one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God if anyone speaks this is one of the kinds of gifts of speaking gifts like prophecy tongues interpretation word of knowledge word of wisdom these are speaking gifts exhortation if anyone speaks let him do it as the oracles of God in other words not from his own wisdom but as something revealed from God to him if anyone ministers, which means serves, the word minister means serve, which is something different than speaking. There are gifts like that, gifts of help, gifts of giving, gifts of showing mercy. These are another category of gifts, those that involve service rather than speaking something. Let them do it as of the ability which God gives. And we know that that is the ability which God gives through his spirit. Which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Now, the church is going to be built up. The, the tabernacle, the house of God, is still being built, as it were, the new one, the spiritual house. And there are skilled workmen, gifted persons, whom God has gifted for that work. And there's mainly two categories of giftedness. There's that which reveals the mind of the Spirit, the ones who speak. And those who speak, whether they be pastors, evangelists, prophets, teachers... Whatever, anyone who's in the role of speaking what the mind of God is, what the mind of the Spirit is, that's part of the building of the body of Christ, part of the building of the temple of God. They are to do it not of their own wisdom, but of the ability, or uh, like the oracles of God, which just means like prophets. And that is, like, what God has shown them is what they should give, not just get up there and spew a bunch of opinions. Now you might say, well, Steve, don't you give me a lot of your opinions? I do. When when there's nothing from God on the subject, sometimes I'll say, well, I have an opinion, or this, I think this or that about it. But I do believe that when it comes to teaching doctrine, and, be, and especially when I'm being dogmatic, and say, this is the way it is, I have to speak that which God has revealed, either directly in Scripture or, or to my own heart, but more often it's what he's revealed directly in the oracles of God here. At any rate, whoever is speaking and building up the church spiritually that way is to do so as through the Spirit of God, but as an oracle, not of his own ability through giftedness. Now, others aren't speakers. There's people who don't talk well. And they're not, they shouldn't be required to. It is wrong, I think, to press everybody into one mold. 
It is wrong to think that everybody ought to be out witnessing or preaching on the street. It just isn't what everyone's called to do, and it isn't what they're gifted to do. And if they do it because they're forced to, because they're feeling guilty, because that's what good Christians are supposed to do, they're going to get out there and do more damage than good because they don't have the gift. They're going to be doing it in the flesh, and it's not going to be any good. So we have to say, well, what is the gift then of this person who doesn't talk well? Well, there's another category of gifts. If anyone serves or ministers, the word minister means serve. Min, the word uh, minister in the noun means a servant. In the verb, it means serve. And anyone who has a serving role, people who fix the cars, clean the toilets, cook the meals, type, or do other service that does not involve speaking, these are ministering to the physical needs. It's the gift of helps, the gift of giving, the gift of showing mercy. These are service gifts. They are every bit as necessary because the church exists on two levels, the spiritual and the physical. The speaking gifts build up the, the, the spiritual. The service gifts uphold the physical needs of the church. That's why there were elders and deacons in churches. The elders were the teachers, and they built up and watched over the spiritual needs of the church. The deacons were the servants. The word deacon means service. They serve the physical needs of the church. The church has needs on two levels, and God has given two kinds of gifts to the church. But the interesting thing is, if anyone is one of these servants, and I suspect that there's more Christians in this category than in the other. I might say this too. Some of my ideas about the gifts are maybe a bit surprising, but because Paul lists in his longer list of gifts mainly speaking kinds of gifts, prophecy, tongues, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and so forth, we sometimes get the impression that everybody ought to get up and say something. That's not necessarily true. Although there are a great number of gifts and a larger number of those listed gifts may have to do with speaking, that doesn't mean that there's an equal number of people for each gift. The word gifts, gift of helps is in there in Romans chapter 12. And I suspect that there may be 80% of the body of Christ that have that one gift. I'm, I'm pulling a figure out of my head. It may be a different percentage. But I, I suspect that the majority of people in the body of Christ have that kind of gift. And the smaller number have some other kind of gift in, that involves public speaking or whatever. If that's true, it means that a person should not be thought more spiritual or more guided by the Spirit if they're preaching or teaching or evangelizing or exhorting than the person who spends his time doing something practical for the kingdom of God. Feeding the hungry. Mowing the lawn of the person who's incapacitated or whatever. Fixing the, the electrical appliances. Fixing the cars. Whatever. These are all... Now, these are all services to the body of Christ. If anyone serves, Peter says, let him do it as of the ability which God gives. Now, this is interesting because usually a guy who can fix a car can fix a car because he's learned how to fix cars. Right? I mean, he's gone to school or he's worked on long morning since from time as a kid or somehow he gained knowledge through natural means of how to fix cars. Likewise, a person who types or something else, usually they didn't get it by inspiration. They usually just learned it and they now are using what they know how to do for the service of the kingdom of God. That's not wrong. That's good. It means, however, that although something may be acquired seemingly naturally, it needs to have God's anointing upon it in order to really be effective. And the person who fixes a car should be doing it not trusting in his native ability or his learned ability, but trusting in the fact that God... He's using him. He's doing it as of the ability which God gives. You know, the person who speaks likewise. I'm up here as a teacher, but I'm not giving you everything I've learned by revelation. I've got to do a bit of studying myself to learn some of the things I'm teaching about. Someone could say, but then anyone could teach if they did just did that much study. Well, let's put it this way. Anyone could talk and say things if they've done this much study. If there's no anointing to teach, though, it's just so much talk. A person may be an excellent car mechanic, but his ministry may not be blessing anyone or, or helping the body of Christ because it's not his ministry, it's not his anointing, it's not his gift. And, and you, you can know the difference. Uh, two people show hospitality. One has a gift of hospitality, the other one doesn't seem to have the gift. And you can tell. On the one hand, the person who, who, you, who you would immediately God is using him. He's doing it as of the ability which God gives. You know, the person who speaks likewise. I'm up here as a teacher, but I'm not giving you everything I've learned by revelation. I've got to do a bit of studying myself to learn some of the things I'm teaching about. Someone could say, but then anyone could teach if they did just did that much study. Well, let's put it this way. Anyone could talk 
and say things if they've done this much study. If there's no anointing to teach, though, it's just so much talk. A person may be an excellent car mechanic, but his ministry may not be blessing anyone or, or helping the body of Christ because it's not his ministry, it's not his anointing, it's not his gift. And, and you, you can know the difference. Uh, two people show hospitality. One has a gift of hospitality. The other one doesn't seem to have the gift. And you can tell. On the one hand, the person who, who, you, who you would immediately describe as having a gift of hospitality, you know, you walk in their house and you feel right at home and, and you just feel totally comfortable and you don't feel like you're imposing at all. Other person may be trying to be hospitable, but there's not really any anointing there. That's, you know, they're serving, but if they're doing it in the flesh, because God hasn't given them a special anointing or ability in the area of that. And, you know, they can go through the actions of hospitality, but when you leave, you feel like, I never did feel comfortable in the, the whole evening. You know, I, was, I always felt we were kind of an imposition, an imposition on these people. Um, some people, you know, serve the body of Christ, but they don't have a good attitude about it, or they don't, they don't see it as something that they're doing unto the Lord, and therefore it, is, is, it, it does more harm than good, in a sense, to the spiritual climate of the body of Christ. But, but other people, they just have a servant's heart, they've got the anointing, uh, I, I know people whose gifts were in plumbing and construction and so forth who did it as of the ability that God gives. I have a friend who had a construction company and he said they were building a house and they came to a plumbing difficulty that they didn't know how to do and one of the brothers in the construction crew had a dream and God showed them what to do. And they did it and it worked. And, uh, you know, here they knew construction in the natural but they were doing it as their, you know, their gift and God, you know, gave them more than what they had in the natural. I, I've studied the Bible, but I hope that when I teach, God will put more into the, into the equation than just what I've studied. I hope that there's blessing on it or anointing on it, or else it's not going to be fruitful. And, you know, I, some guys have ministries in fixing cars. Hey, don't, I mean, that's, that is not a cop-out. Some people say, well, you say you have a ministry of fixing cars. That's no ministry. That's, you know, that's just a business. Well, it's true. If it is a business, it's not a ministry. I'm talking about people who really have a ministry. They might even have a business too, but when it comes to doing things for, for the body of Christ or for the poor or whatever, they do it free or whatever because it is their ministry. It's, their, it's what they do for God as opposed to what they do for income. And uh, people who have that ministry often can testify that, you know, as a particular perplexing automobile, automotive problem, that God has shown them what the problem is and, you know, what it could have been any number of things instead of going through and testing on, troubleshooting every system and so forth. They didn't have to go through all that because God just told them what was wrong. Hey, I don't know anything about cars and I certainly don't have a ministry of fixing cars because I can't fix my own car even. But I've known the phenomenon of God telling me what was wrong when I had no natural way of knowing. And I imagine those who, who are really called of God to really maintain the cars for the missionaries or whatever, I imagine they experience that a great deal if they're really called to it because... When a person has a gift of serving, he says they are to do it as of the ability which God gives. Sure, there's some either native or learned talent there as well. No, no doubt Bezalel, the guy who made the things for the tabernacle, he probably came from a long line of, of uh, you know, gem setters or whatever. You know, he may, have, he may have had some background in the natural to it, but God anointed him and took his talent and put it to work for a special purpose to build the house of God. And uh, so it shouldn't be thought that just because you had a, maybe some skill when you were not a Christian, that now that can't be your gift because God, that what makes it a gift is that God anoints whatever it is and, and makes it fruitful for his purposes. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. That's why these are gifts are called manifestations of the Spirit. Can a person manifest the Spirit when he's raking the leaves or mowing the lawn or sweeping the floor or cooking meals? He can't. Or she can. But some people can do the same things and there's no manifestation of the Spirit at all. Uh, I, I don't know that I need to explain that anymore because I think you probably have experienced examples of what I'm talking about. The point is, there are various gifts and these gifts of the Spirit are enablements from the Spirit to do what Jesus did. Now let me tell you something. As I understand it, the gifts of the Spirit are just a redistribution of the various ministries of Christ among his present body now. When Jesus was on the earth as a man, he possessed all the gifts with the possible exception of tongues and interpretation. We don't have any record of him ever speaking in tongues. 
or interpreting tongues. Apart from that, every one of the more than 15 gifts of the Spirit that are listed in the Bible were manifested in the life of Jesus. He had the gift of teaching, the gift of prophecy, the gift of healing, the gift of miracles, the gift of discerning of spirits, the gift of word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, uh, and the rest. The gift of exhortation, the gift of service, the gift of giving, whatever. You name it, any gift, he had it. In fact, the gifts that we now have are simply those gifts that Jesus had now given to his present body. He was in a body when he was on the earth, but that body is now in heaven. That body has now been... Uh, exalted to the position of headship over a new body that's made up of many members. And just as the body of Jesus had all the gifts, so does the body of Christ today. The church have all the gifts, but no one has them all. I have one, you have another, or someone else has a third, and a fourth, and a fifth. To one is given the word of knowledge. To another, the word of wisdom. To another, that one. And to another, that one. Uh, he's distributed the gifts individually, but when we all use our gifts together, then the body of Christ is still functioning in all the same ministries Jesus functioned in when he was on earth. Just a different form that his body exists in, but all the same gifts are there. In other words, um, the gifts of the Spirit are just so many aspects of God, of Jesus' own ministry continuing. He did ministries of various sorts when he was on earth. Those ministries are all continuing through his present body, through the church. And that's why... Paul always seems to link the doctrine of the body of Christ, the church being the body of Christ, in his discussions of the gifts. 1 Corinthians 12 is a notable uh, example. Uh, also Romans 12, where he lists gifts. It's always in a connection of talking about how we are the body of Christ. Christ did these things. We are his body. That These things are done through us as well. But, one of us may have the gift of hammering nails, like Jesus did for some years of his life, you know? Uh, or the gift of feeding hungry people, like Jesus did. Or the gift of prophesying, like he did. Uh, none of us have all the gifts, because that would be essentially like Jesus, exactly in that respect, but the body corporately, together, has all the gifts. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit that was in Christ. And when Jesus ascended, he sent that Spirit down to us, so that we now are empowered and enabled and informed by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God speaks to us. He enables us to do whatever it is we're supposed to do, carry on the continuing work of Jesus in this planet. Now, concerning the relationship of the Holy Spirit to the Christian, you know, in this whole series on knowing God, our main concern has to do with our relationship with God. What is our relationship with the Holy Spirit? Well, um, in this, we get into some, some areas that not all Christians agree on, but I'll try to give as much as possible a biblical, a biblical discussion of that. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 24, First John chapter 3 and verse 24, it says, Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, in Christ, that is, and he in him, that is, Christ is in us, and we're in Christ. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. How do you know that Jesus dwells in you? By the presence of the Spirit who dwells in you. Now, what he's saying is, if Christ dwells in you, then so does his Spirit. And the presence of his Spirit is the indication that Christ does. That means that if anyone is a true Christian and has Christ, then also the Spirit dwells in them. Every Christian who is a genuine born-again believer has the Spirit, therefore. And we see that also in 1 John chapter 4, and verse 13, just a uh, few verses later. 1 John 4, 13, John says, By this we know that we abide in Him and that He in us, because He has given us of His Spirit. So the presence of the Holy Spirit in one's life is the, is the indicator that a person is saved, is a Christian. Paul said in a verse we read earlier in Romans 8 and 9, If any man does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So there's, there's no question of all Christians having the Holy Spirit or not. They do. We do. And uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, which, says, uh, which affirms this also, 
1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13 says, For by one Spirit were we all baptized into one body. For by one Spirit were we all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink of one Spirit. All Christians have the same Spirit. In Ephesians 4, uh, Paul says, concerning us the things that we all have in common, he says there is one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one God and Father, but all one Spirit. We all have the Holy Spirit if we're Christians. That's, that's just, that comes with the, with the package of regeneration and forgiveness of sins. When God does that to us, when He cleanses us, He also gives us His Spirit. This was predicted back in Ezekiel, chapter 36. Ezekiel, chapter 36, beginning with verse 25. For three verses. 25 to 27. God says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will keep my judgments and do them. Every Christian has the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, did people have the Holy Spirit before Jesus came? Before there were Christians, as we call them? Well, you will find in the Old Testament some people had the Holy Spirit at times. The prophets spoke by the Spirit, and sometimes we read of them being filled with the Spirit. We sometimes read of the Spirit coming upon them. So not only prophets, either. We know that the guys who, like we pointed out, the people who built the tabernacle furniture had the Spirit and were gifted by the Spirit. God had put the Spirit in them. Uh, Samson, on, when he had his fits of supernatural strength, was not acting upon muscular development. It says the Spirit came upon him and he slew a thousand with the jawbone of an ass. The Spirit came upon him and he ripped the gate off the hinges. The Spirit came upon him and he exhibited tremendous strength. Samson's strength was not muscular. I doubt if you've ever seen a picture in a Bible picture book of Samson without these huge, rippling, Arnold Schwarzenegger type muscles. Samson may or may not have been had a good physique, but his strength was not attributed to muscle. If he had those kind of bulging muscles, it would have been no mystery where his strength came from. You know, the Philistines wouldn't have had to pay anyone to find out the secret of his strength. The guy's walking around, he can't even touch his ear, you know, because his muscles are too big. Uh, what's the secret of that guy's strength? Hey, no secret. Look at those muscles. That's the secret of his strength. No, the guy apparently didn't have any obvious, physical, visible signs of unusual strength. But the Bible says the Spirit came upon him and then manifest strength. You know, some people who are possessed with, the, with demons exhibited supernatural strength. Isn't that true? We know of at least one man possessed with demons who broke chains when they put on. That's a manifestation of spirit. It could be a demon spirit, or in Samson's case, the Holy Spirit. But the point is, the enablement to do things that could not ordinarily be done for God is what the Spirit did for people, even in the Old Testament as well as now. Now, I don't know to put this. I believe the Holy Spirit came into people sometimes in the Old Testament, but I don't believe there's any case of the Spirit coming into a person and staying. I believe there were occasions of, ins of inspiration. There were occasions of enablement for special crises. But I don't believe that in the Old Testament there was anyone who had the Holy Spirit abiding permanently in them. Now, I may be wrong. But if I am right, then those persons who did have the Holy Spirit abiding permanently in them were the rare exceptions. People like Moses, David, a few people, maybe. I mean, there are some indications that David might have had the abiding presence of the Spirit because when he sinned with Bathsheba, he prayed, God, don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Uh, as if he had known the regular presence of the Spirit in his life. Moses, there's some indication he may have had the abiding presence of the Spirit at all times. But if so, you can see it was a few basic exceptional leaders that God put His Spirit upon. That's different than now. Because every Tom, Dick, and Harry 
or Sue, Mary, and Jane in, in the body of Christ now has the Holy Spirit. That's interesting. If you would uh, take the time with me to look at the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers, if I had planned to give this reference, I would have written it down. I didn't know immediately what the verse, but I will try to find it. Chapter uh, 11. Moses complained to God because the people of Israel were too big a burden for him to bear himself. They were a bunch of rebels, grumblers, and Moses alone, frankly, had to, had to handle them. And Moses complained to God. In Numbers 11, 11, Moses said to the Lord, Why have you afflicted your servant, meaning me, and why have I not found favor in your sight that you have laid the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I beget them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a guardian carries a nursing child to the land which you swore to their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give all these people? They were out in the wilderness and they were complaining they wanted meat and not manna. For they weep all over me, saying, give us meat that we may eat. I am not able to bear all these people alone because the burden is too heavy for me. If you treat me like this, please kill me here and now, if I have found favor in your sight. <laughs> if you like me, kill me. In other words. And do not let me see my wretchedness. Now notice God's response, verse 16. So the Lord said to Moses, Gather me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tabernacle of meeting that they may stand there with you. Then I will come down and talk with you there. I will take of the spirit that is upon you and will put the same spirit upon them and they shall bear the burden of the people with you that you may not bear it yourself alone. And so Moses actually did this. He gathered the 70 people together, brought them before the tabernacle. And it says in verse 25, Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him, and took of the spirit that was upon him and placed the same upon the seventy elders. And it happened when the spirit rested upon them that they prophesied, although they did not do so again. A mark that they were spirit-filled, apparently was, that they prophesied initially on that occasion. Sort of like the initial evidence. And verse 26, notice this. But two men had remained in the camp. The name of one was Eldad, the name of the other was Medad. No doubt uh, the sons of Dudad. But uh, anyway, and the Spirit rested upon them. Uh, the Spirit rested upon them. Now, now they weren't among. They were among those listed among the seventy, but they had not gone out to the tabernacle. Yet they prophesied in the camp. In other words, they weren't under supervision from the shepherd. You see, they were not. They were not under the covering of the tabernacle, and they were out there among the people uh, prophesying, which was uh, at least one young man thought, or two, that this was some threat to Moses' authority, and the young man ran and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. So Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, one of his choice men, answered and said, Moses, my Lord, forbid them. Now Moses' response is very insightful, insightful, enlightening. Moses said to them, to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Oh, that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. Now, it's obvious that it was not the case under the Old Covenant that the, all the Lord's people were prophets, and that he would put his spirit upon them. It was only a few. They were a few. Initially, it was just Moses, apparently, and then 70 others. But Moses said, hey, I'm not jealous. I wish everybody of God's people was a prophet and had the spirit upon them. But unfortunately, Moses never lived to see that reality. Nonetheless, one of the prophets later on, one of the ones who did have the spirit upon him, Joel, made a prediction along these lines. In Joel chapter 2, and in Joel chapter 2, verse 28, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Matthew, Mark, Joel. Okay. Joel 2, verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. 
And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my servants and on my maidservants will I pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth and so forth. Now, the interesting thing here is that Moses said, Would to God that all the Lord's people were prophets and he would put his spirit upon them. Joel says essentially that's exactly what God has in mind. He's going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And they shall all prophesy, just like the 70 did at the tabernacle. Amos pre- or Joel predicted a time which Moses never lived to see, nor did Joel ever live to see it. But a time that was some distance in the future at that time, 800 years after Joel's time, when God would do just that. And it was, of course, we know, fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. When there were 120 initially in the upper room, and the Spirit was poured out upon them, and they were filled with the Spirit, and they spoke with tongues, and the crowd gathered and so forth, and said, what's going on here? Some said, oh, these are just a bunch of drunkards. And Peter stood up and said, these are not drunk with wine, as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. Bars aren't even open yet. He said, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he quotes this very prophecy. In the last days, I will pour out my, uh, my spirit on all flesh and so forth. They shall prophesy. In other words, Joel, Peter was saying, this is that time in history that Joel predicted where according to the longing that Moses had expressed that all the Lord's people would be prophets, that he would distribute his spirit universally among those who are his people. This is that. This has come. This is the church. This is the new covenant. God said, I will take away your stony heart, I'll give you a soft heart of flesh, and I'll give you my spirit. That is the promise of the Father. And Jesus told the disciples, wait in Jerusalem until you receive the promise of my Father. Uh, And you are endued with power from on high. And so they did. Today, there is a, a significant difference. In, in, in the terms of the New Covenant as opposed to the Old with reference to the Holy Spirit. Namely, the Holy Spirit was only to the few and, and perhaps only coming and going in the lives of those few in the Old Testament. If the Holy Spirit remained at all, it was only with the very few. Moses wished it would be with more. Amos, uh, excuse me, I keep saying Amos, Joel said it will be someday with more. It will be with everybody, and of course, today that is the case. The prophecy of Joel has been fulfilled. God has poured out His Spirit on all flesh. Now, we've talked before, and we won't now again, about the difference between the Spirit in you or upon you and those kind of things. Those have been discussed uh, with reference to the baptism of the Holy Spirit in an earlier lecture. But uh, I do want to say that the main uh, privilege that the New Testament offers that was not available in the Old Testament was to the general Christian public the presence, the abiding presence and filling of God's Holy Spirit, which was known only by a few prophets and Muslim men or whatever in the past, but but which we know now uh, ourselves forever. In Ephesians chapter 1, and... uh, What verse do I want here? Is it 17? Um, No, let me see here. You're still looking, I'm still looking. Here we go. Verse 13. Ephesians 1, 13. In Him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit of promise. Why? Because God had promised the Holy Spirit. He was the promise of the Father. We Christians have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. What does that mean? The word seal there has nothing to do with sealing a jar or sealing a, 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 a grease seal on an engine or something like that. A seal has to do with a signet, which is a concept we don't really know quite as well in our culture as they knew then. Whenever a, an official document from an authority was distributed or sent out, a decree from a king, for example, or an official letter to be acknowledged as uh, you know, carrying the authority of its sender. It had to have a seal to guarantee its authenticity. The king, let's, let's use a king as an illustration here, would have a ring. And on that ring would have his personal signet, a raised impression. And after he'd written a letter or someone had written it at dictate, at his dictation, 
a bit of wax would be poured wet on the page, and he'd stick the signet of his ring in that wax. It would harden, it would bear his seal. It had nothing to do with sealing the book shut, sealing the document shut, although many times the, the thing was sealed shut with that very thing. But the, the essential meaning of the seal was it was the mark of authenticity. It was the mark that this was no counterfeit. This was really from the king himself. And when Paul says, we have the seal of God, actually he says, we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, he's saying that the Holy Spirit serves in our lives as the mark of authentic belonging to God. We really are his, and we know it, because his we have the seal. We have the signet of, of the king upon us in the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. In the book of Revelation, when the locusts were unleashed on the world in chapter 9, it says they were told to, um, to punish or to torment everybody except those who had the seal of God, which I take to be the Holy Spirit, symbolically described. Uh, later on in Ephesians, in chapter 4 of Ephesians, and verse uh, 30, Paul says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The day of redemption, he means the day of Jesus' coming, the redemption of our mortal bodies. He speaks of it also in those terms in Romans 8. But until Jesus comes back, we have this seal. Uh, Paul has also referred at times to the Holy Spirit as the earnest of the inheritance. In fact, that's back in, also in uh, Ephesians 1. Verse 14, after he's spoken of the seat being sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, he says, who is the guarantee of our inheritance? The King James says earnest. It's like earnest money. When you're going to buy a house, often you don't have the cash on hand, but you, if you want to seal it up and, and, and make sure the bargain is determined and no one else can get in there, before you get your money together, you put down some earnest money. It's like a down payment. It's Now you've got money on it, and no one else can come and buy it up from under you while you're getting your financing together. And the earnest money means you mean business. It means you're really coming back with the rest of the money. You've got an investment in this thing now, and you're not going to let it go. That's what the word guarantee here means, or earnest. The Holy Spirit is the down payment that God has made on us. It's the earnest money that he's put down to guarantee that he's going to come back for the rest later. And uh, so the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives is the assurance that we have that Although it's yet future, and we don't know very much about the future, we know this much. When Jesus comes back, he's going to recognize us as one of his own. He's going to come claim us back because we have the seal, his seal of ownership. We have the down payment. We've got the earnest money put down on us in the person of the Holy Spirit given to us. Yes? Most people would use that word seal as like eternal security that can't be brought back. Or yeah, and I don't think that that's a fair inference. Yeah, I don't think that eternal security is the, is the concept that Paul is referring to. I think he's referring to the mark of ownership. Whether that seal could be removed by someone apostatizing is a, is a different question, not addressed in the past. That's right. Uh, yeah, the reason that they use it that way, they see it that way, is they tend to think of our, our modern idea of a seal. When you seal something shut, nothing else is going to get in it or get out of it. And they think of us, you know, we've been sealed as if sealed into this thing, like, like you know, preserved, sealed in a jar, you know. They're not getting out. And therefore, if you've been sealed into God's family, then you're in there for keeps and you can't get out. Well, that's not the concept. The concept is not sealing a jar shut or sealing a lid down. It's, it's the idea of just having the mark of the signet, the mark of authenticity of your conversion. The proof that you're really a Christian is that you have the Holy Spirit. Now, what is the proof that you have the Holy Spirit? Proof. That's yeah, right. Proof. It, it's hand proof. <laughs> Sealed. No. Uh, it is. Now you got ahead of me. I shouldn't have asked you because you were likely to answer. But uh, the the evidence of the presence of the Holy Spirit, I do not understand to be gifts. I believe that everyone has a gift, but not all gifts are visible. What if you have a gift of helps? How can anyone be sure? You know, that that's supernatural. I mean, God knows, and you may know, but I mean, it's not the kind of thing you can point to. Oh, look, look how many floors I swept. That proves I have the Holy Spirit. Well, maybe it does to you and to God. But other people may be unconvinced. I don't think a particular gift, or just being gifted, 
is a proof of the Holy Spirit. For one thing, it's not even a proof of being a Christian. If we mean by that supernatural gifts, miracles, tongues, prophecies, those things don't even prove a person is a Christian, much less that they are filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said many would come to him on that day. This is Matthew chapter 7, saying, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do many wonderful works in your name? And you say, I don't, I don't know you. Never did know you. It's Matthew 7, 22 and 23. The idea is apparently some people who don't even know Jesus can have counterfeit gifts. And that would include tongues. There are witch doctors who speak in tongues. And uh, so the presence of tongues is not the uh, compelling evidence that a person is filled with the Spirit, nor is prophecy or miracles or any other supernatural thing. The Holy Spirit may indeed bring those manifestations, but that's not the normative evidence. The evidence is the fruit. Jesus said in the same chapter, Matthew 7, that you better beware of false prophets, verse 15. Some come in sheep's clothing. They look like Christians in general, but they're really wolves. They're not converted. And he says in verse 16, Matthew 7, 16, you will know them by their fruits. Not whether they prophesy, not whether they speak in tongues, not whether they do mighty works or cast out demons. Many who do that, he doesn't know them. They are, in fact, wolves. They look like Christians outwardly because they're sensational demonstrations, but they're not real Christians. You know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or pigs from thistles? The way of knowing the presence of the Spirit in life is whether the fruit of the Spirit is present. If you've heard me use this illustration before, indulge me, but I, I, I'm, I'm fond of an illustration that Juan Carlos Ortiz uses in his book, Disciple. By quoting him, I don't mean to endorse everything in that book, nor everything in his other books, nor in his preaching. I've, I've learned some good things from Juan Carlos Ortiz, but I don't agree with everything he says. But he is excellent at giving pithy illustrations of his concepts. And he's, he's making this very point in his book, Disciple. He says it's not the gifts that prove that, you know, the person has spiritual life or the Holy Spirit. It's the fruit. And he, he says, in Argentina, which is where he's from, in Buenos Aires, he says, there are not many trees. <clears throat> so at Christmas time, very few people can afford to get real trees. They're just in short supply. So most people have trees that are made up of tin foil and paper and, you know, bits of green paper and wire and things like that. He says they're not very expensive. You can buy them for two or three dollars. You put them in the house. And he says, prior to Christmas, you may find, you know, expensive gifts hanging on those trees. He says, you might find Omega watches and, you know, jewelry and so forth hanging on the trees. It's the custom to hang the gifts on the trees there. And so, you might look at those gifts and be dazzled by the trees and say, this must be a very valuable tree. Look at these gifts. But he says, the day after Christmas, on December 26th, if you drive down the street, you'll see all these trees out in the garbage. Because they're not worth anything. The gifts are removed. And the tree is worthless. And he says, the fact that there were fine gifts on this tree was no indication whatsoever of the quality of the tree. Because those gifts were put there by somebody else. The tree didn't produce them. He says, on the other hand, if you see a tree with nice, wholesome, luscious, beautiful apples on it, that will tell you something about the nature and the health of that tree. Because a good tree will produce good fruit. A bad tree will produce bad fruit. Jesus said that. And it's true, of course, in nature. He knew that. He was using an illustration from nature. The point being, he goes on to say, if you would go to an apple tree and say, why is it that you don't have any Omega watches hanging on you? He said the, the apple tree could just say, well, you know, I beg your pardon, but nobody has put any Omega watches on my branches. It's not my fault. But if you go to an apple tree and say, why don't you have any apples? Well, the apple tree would be speechless because it's supposed to have apples. and It's its own fault. It's its, its own... It's its own quality of life that is deficient if it doesn't have any apples. He says it's that way with the Spirit. Many people have gifts of the Spirit, but that tells you nothing about what kind of persons they are, spiritual or otherwise, because someone else puts the gifts on them. A gift is something given to you without reference to your own merit. But if a person has the fruit of the Spirit, that proves that the character and the, and the life of the Spirit is present. And what is the fruit of the Spirit? We have it in Galatians. It's love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, self-control goodness faithfulness what else I think gentleness and kindness are different translations in, di in different translations of the same word but those are those are things that describe the quality of a person's character something we'll discuss in another week in fact uh, very soon
But the, the point is that the character of Jesus is what the Holy Spirit produces in the life. And, and in cre- now fruit, of course, doesn't come out fully grown on a tree. As we know, in the seasons, when it's fruit bearing season, the, the fruit comes out as little buds first and it gets bigger and it's usually pretty green for a while and you couldn't eat it. Eventually it ripens in the right time. Concerning the man who meditates day and night on the word of God, Psalm 1 says he bears forth his fruit in his season. And you might say, well, I guess maybe I don't have the Spirit because I'm not very patient. I'm not very long-suffering. I'm not very gentle. I'm not very meek. Well, that is, a, that is something to be concerned about because those are fruits. But you have to realize, too, that fruit is not at every point in the season of mature ripeness. And there is a growth. If you can see that there is a growth of, of a new fruit growing in your life, love, you love differently. You're more peaceful, more joyful, more gentle, more meek than you were before you were a Christian. This is a far better indication that you really have been converted than if you speak in tongues. Or prophets, I raised the dead for that matter. And so, the Holy Spirit is known largely in His work in our lives producing holiness. I would say the principal work of the Holy Spirit, in addition to what we've mentioned, I mentioned He communicates to us, He empowers us, those are all things that are somehow connected with the gifts. But the principal and fundamental work of the Spirit in our lives is in producing His own character, which is holiness. He's the Holy Spirit. And if He is controlling our lives, our lives will become holier than they were. And eventually, it'll be no mockery, just call us holy saints. The word saints means holy ones. And the mark of the Holy Spirit's work in our life is most seen in holiness of conduct, in the reproduction of the, of the character of Christ in our own lives. Therefore, most of the discussion about the Holy Spirit in Paul's writings is not about the gifts, but, against, uh, but about holiness. Look with me very quickly, we're going to have to close here, but look quickly at Romans chapter uh, 8. Again, we were there a moment ago. Definitely something else. In Romans chapter 8, we won't read chapter 7, but you might be familiar with chapter 7. He talks about the frustration of wanting to do the right thing, but continually failing to do the right thing. Of having a mental assent that the law of God is good, but not having the moral fortitude and wherewithal to live up to your convictions. You want to obey the law, but in the flesh you don't have the power to obey the law. Then he gives the solution in verse eight, uh, chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That last line is not textually attested well. That statement, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, is apparently borrowed from the end of verse 4, where it appears again. Most manuscripts lack it in verse 1, but have it in verse 4. So, yeah, probably, it's not. it doesn't belong here at the end of verse 1. But, the point is, he goes on to say in verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin he condemned sin in the flesh, that the, verse 4, the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, he says, in the flesh, we couldn't keep the law. In fact, the law was weak in that respect, because through the flesh, we were not able to keep it, and the law, therefore, didn't help us, it only condemned us. But, something has changed now. If we walk not according to the flesh, that is, we don't walk in the power of our natural, fleshly, you know, strength and and willpower and so forth, but we walk according to the Spirit, what happens? What is the result? The righteous requirements of the law are fulfilled in us, in our lives. So that we live a righteous and a holy life if we're walking in the Spirit. But what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Well, there's much about this in Paul's writings, but later on he talks about, uh, for instance, in verse, um, verse 13, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. The next verse, 14, says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Walking in the Spirit involves at least these two things. Through the Spirit, not through your own willpower and fleshly uh, resolve, but through the Spirit, you put to death the sinful deeds of the body. You can't do that in the flesh, because your flesh loves those sinful deeds. But the Spirit 
can enable you to overcome them. And being led by the Spirit. This is what being walking in the Spirit involves. It means the Spirit enabling me and the Spirit guiding me to live the way I should. If I have the Spirit guiding me, I welcome His presence and His fullness in my life. And He enables me. Then the result is I fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. Paul, in a parallel discussion in Galatians, and there are many parallel passages in Galatians to Romans, but Galatians is a little shorter, and so sometimes it's the same thing in only a few verses, but in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, which is very clearly a parallel passage, Galatians 5, 16, Paul says, I say then, walk in the Spirit. Just like Paul said in Romans, he said, if we walk according to the Spirit, we will fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. We won't be subject to the flesh. We will overcome the lust of the flesh. Well, here he says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so you cannot do the things you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Why? Because he goes on to say the fruit of the Spirit is... Verse 22, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there's no law. So if you're led by the Spirit and He's producing this fruit in you, you're walking in the Spirit, He produces His character in you, you don't do anything that breaks the law. So you can't be said to be under the law. You're not under the law if you're within its limits. When the Spirit of God produces His character within you, the character of Jesus in you, well then you do the things automatically that the law requires and therefore you can't be the law can't touch you the law can't touch you when you're driving in the speed limit it's only when you drive over the speed limit that you're under the law but if you drive up the speed limit because of your own good sense you're not under the law although you do keep the law if you don't kill people because the law tells you not to kill people that's one thing if you don't kill people because you don't want to kill people that's better still you're still keeping the law, but you're not under the law. The law doesn't tell you to do that. You, your own conscience, the Holy Spirit in you, working in your nature, in your character, makes it repulsive to you, the idea of killing. And so, you walk in the Spirit and you have a whole new dynamic, a whole new uh, quality of character that the Spirit Himself produces in you. How do you walk in the Spirit? Paul never says it in so many words, but I understand it to me. We walk by faith. Is what Paul says elsewhere. I believe that walking in the Spirit is the same as walking by faith. We trust not ourselves, but the Spirit. Paul said in Philippians 3 3, We are the true circumcision who rejoice in Christ Jesus and worship God in the Spirit and put no confidence in the flesh. Philippians 3 3. It seems like putting confidence in the flesh is the opposite of worshiping in the Spirit. And if we put our confidence not in our flesh, that is in our natural resources, in our natural goodness, in our natural resolve, in our natural willpower, but if we put our confidence in the Spirit, then that results in walking in the Spirit. And we'll have more to say about walking in the Spirit on other occasions. But suffice it to say that the person of the Holy Spirit is, is our possession and our inheritance, serves as a seal of God's ownership and a guarantee of His of his planning to come back and finish off pain and off and bring it home. Us home, that is. And uh, he enables us, he communicates to us, also he speaks to our own heart, as well as through gifted persons. But most of all, most importantly, he makes us like Jesus. And this likeness to Christ is compared with fruit. And one thing about fruit is it ripens over a period of time. The Bible does not teach in any passage I'm aware of that you get a crisis experience of holiness as a second blessing. I believe, I believe the baptism of the Spirit is a second blessing, but I don't believe that entire sanctification is, as some doctrines teach. I believe that sanctification is a process of being maturing like fruit.